Hey, um, let's get started. Um, thank you very much for coming um, to the um, second um, Sandstar um, Colosseum event uh, and uh, the fourth Tower Center event of this semester. Um, we started with uh, U.S.-Mexico relationship and then moving to immigration. And last week we had a, a seminar on um, China-Japan East Southeast Asia relationship, and we continue um, talking about Asia. Um, and um, I'm uh, Hiroki Takeuchi. Uh, I'm a director of Sandstar program on Japan East Asia. Um, and uh, uh, today, um, we are going to talk about Trump and Asia, a uh, very <laughs> predictable um, <laughs> situation. Um, Trump and Asia, one word. <laughs> 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 Um, and uh, I'll, t um, I'll be uh, one of the um, three uh, speakers uh, together with uh, uh, my colleague um, um, Diana Newton um, and uh, Lai Leong. Um, but before starting, uh, I'd like to um, uh, introduce um, a few um, distinguished guests. Um, one of them is uh, Dr. Haruo Iguchi, of the uh, professor of uh, Kansai Gatwin University. Thank you. And uh, he is, uh, he will be a speaker uh, of another event uh, that, um, by uh, Japan Metal Society Dallas Fort Worth uh, on Friday uh, at noon uh, in the Intercontinental uh, Hotel um, in Addison. And she's, he's also uh, talking about uh, U.S.-Japan relationship um, under the new U.S. administration. Um, and also, uh, speaking of Japan Society, uh, we have uh, Executive Director of the Japan Society, Dallas Porters, uh, Anna McFarland. Um, well, SMU has a strong ties with uh, uh, Dr. Iguchi and uh, um, um, Anna McFarland uh, in the sense that uh, both are uh, related to uh, Kansai Gakuin University, KGU, uh, in uh, Osaka. Um, we started a new uh, summer program, uh, summer international studies program at KGU uh, last summer, uh, and Claire uh, went to the, uh, participate in the uh, five-week program last um, uh, summer, um, and um, so um, and and um, so um, that's actually. Uh, and then this year uh, we are also uh, going back to um, KGU uh, this summer, and one of the. Um, one of the highlights of the program is we visited the headquarters of uh, Toyota, um, <laughs> and uh, it's one of its uh, factories, uh, Takaoka factory in the Toyota city, and we have a guest from Toyota, Mr. Sugimoto. Um, he just arrived, last, last month you arrived in uh, uh, Dallas um, from, uh, uh, from Toyota city. Um, so uh, as you know, um, uh, now uh, North America Toyota is moving its headquarters uh, to Plano uh, from Los Angeles. So, um, um, and uh, also we have a uh, um, uh, guest from Japan Airlines, uh, uh, Kyoto Bibas, um, sales manager of Japan Airlines. Okay, so, um, so I'm now um, start, uh, starting and then I'm, I'd like to uh, first uh, talk about, starting with uh, talking about um, uh, U.S. relationship with China first, uh, and then um, Diana will talk about uh, U.S. relationship with Japan and Korea, um, and then Lai is going to talk about um, U.S. Uh, relationship with uh, Southeast Asia. Um, we actually had the uh, informal uh, conversation over lunch um, a few days ago, um, and uh, um, so one thing that we uh, realized was uh, um, well, we try to like, uh, like find the keyword, and then the keyword is uh, uncertainty or lack of certainty. <laughs> so, um, and uh, so we figure out like three things. Um, one is uh, uh, there is uncertainty of um, uh, inter uh, communication uh, over uh, intentions uh, of the United States, um, which is actually very problematic. Uh, secondly, um, Trump administration is quite a bit, uh, quite um, skeptical uh, at best uh, about international institutions and also the rules uh, in international relations in general. And the third is uh, uh, Trump administration is quite um, protectionist um, 
um, stance. Mm -hmm. So, um, so um, um, kind of uncertainty uh, for uh, intentions, uh, and then also um, skepticism uh, over uh, international institutions and the protectionism are the three things that is quite certain uh, from the um, Trump administration. So uh, that's actually the common theme for uh, today's uh, panel. Um, by the way, uh, one thing that I forgot uh, mentioning uh, before the, uh, the, uh, intro uh, during the introduction is um, I just talked with uh, my colleague uh, Luisa de Rosal, uh, the director of the um, uh, Texas Mexico um, uh, Relationship, um, Institute of Texas Mexico Relationship. Uh, and uh, she had a very interesting idea of which we are going to uh, organize uh, this coming fall. So uh, can you talk yes. a little bit so about I was talking it. to Dr. Takayuchi and what a timely conversation today is on you know the administration's relationship with Asia. Please come in. Food over here. Um, but how in a time when Mexico is also having an interesting relationship with the Trump administration uh, with the renegotiation of NAFTA, TPP, um, how about talking with Japan and Mexico and the opportunities for diversification? Uh, well, Dr. Takayuchi reminded me when we had the governor of Querétaro here visiting, he said that for Mexico, China tends to be a competitor and Japan is a partner. Um, so I said, why don't we play off that idea and talk about what are the opportunities for companies for trade between Japan and Mexico and really try to inform policymakers um, on, in Japan and in Mexico as they look forward and beyond the U.S., uh, sadly, but we're beyond, we all need to start with beyond. Um, how, how can we strengthen the Japan-Mexico relationship? So stay tuned, because I think that's going to be a really timely conversation that Dr. Zakiuski is going to help me put together, and I'm so glad that he agreed to lead it that discussion. So we'll have it in the fall. Yeah, so uh, stay tuned. Um, and then also between them, um, we have a, a lot of more events so <laughs> on various issues. Um, and uh, speaking of pitch, um, just one thing I mentioned is, uh, as you may know, um, after uh, Trump uh, tweeted about you know, uh, attacking some automobile companies that have factories in Mexico, uh, Ford, Ford decided to cancel the plan of building factory in Mexico, while Toyota decided to keep, keep the plan of the opening new factory in Mexico in, uh, I think, 2019. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then um, last month when I was uh, um, uh, interviewed by uh, a Japanese newspaper, uh, I mentioned that uh, um, if the Toyota opened the uh, uh, factory uh, assembly lines in Mexico, and then that, sh that will actually increase the jobs of um, uh, high skilled jobs of uh, producing parts in the United States. And thanks to NAFTA, um, most of the uh, factories, um, uh, assembly lines in Mexico actually uh, purchase uh, parts from um, the United States. And as you may know, uh, producing parts is a very high skilled, good jobs, uh, high wage uh, jobs. So uh, that's actually um, very important, I would say, for the United US economy. But today I'm going to talk about um, U.S.-China relationship, um, and um, so uncertainty is a key word, and uh, uncertainty is really uh, bad for uh, international politics. Maybe good for uh, business uh, negotiation, as uh, Trump says. I'm, I'm skeptical, but maybe, I don't know, and you, uh, probably many of you, those business people would know uh, more about it. but. Then, it's bad for politics, bad for international politics, because in international politics, especially international cooperation and alliance, assurance is important, and then assurance is based on trust, and then trust is based on certainty. So uncertainty gives the reverse course of what I have just said. So um, uncertainty really um, is uh, problematic uh, for um, alliance and also international cooperation. Um, so um, today I want to talk about uh, three things. Um, focusing on um, China's domestic politics. So uh, one thing that I, I'm thinking when I'm observing, um, I find when I'm observing um, Trump's um, policy, especially the Trump's China policy, is it seems that they, he doesn't, and then also his team does not take into consideration 
uh, domestic politics uh, of China. And uh, one thing that uh, I, we should keep in mind is uh, China, especially Chinese Communist Party, has a big event this year. Uh, in October or November, they will have a, a party congress, Chinese Communist Party Congress, uh, which takes place every five years. And uh, the biggest um, function or biggest uh, job of uh, party congress is uh, um, uh, choosing uh, or selecting, or in some way, um, who will lead the nation. Xi Jinping will not step down, uh, so as uh, Premier Li Keqiang, but uh, they will have to choose uh, vice president and vice prime minister. And uh, surprisingly, so far, uh, last, like, um, last two successions, um, <coughs> president and prime minister stepped down after serving for 10 years. So uh, term, term limit is working. And then vice president and vice premier became president and premier. So uh, there's no guarantee that would happen uh, in five years. Uh, same thing would happen uh, in five years. We don't know. But uh, it's very important who will be chosen to be a vice president and vice premier. And of course, China does not have election to choose those people. So. Uh, there is a very um, severe, intensive power struggle, political struggle, going on in the Chinese central government. And Xi Jinping really has to handle it. So Xi Jinping has to face not just the United States, but also has to face his rivals in, um, in the uh, Chinese Communist Party. So. One thing that we should keep in mind is if like, the U.S. administration attacks Xi Jinping and weaken Xi Jinping, it doesn't just mean that try to weaken China, but also weaken Xi Jinping's position against those rivals, which means kind of U.S. Kind of attack on Xi Jinping might mean empowering his rivals. And uh, <coughs> Probably his rivals are more hardliners and more conservatives in the sense of anti-reformist um, than Xi Jinping. So, uh, and then basically we do not want to empower hardliners and anti-reformists in the Chinese Communist Party. So, uh, so criticizing China or attacking China has a kind of complicated implications. Um, so, uh, so that's actually one thing that we should um, keep in mind. So uh, the first thing that I would like to uh, talk about is uh, um, Chinese, um, uh, the inflexibility, I would say the inflexibility of the Chinese foreign policy. So um, Chinese Communist Party, or Chinese government is not good at changing foreign policy um, quickly. So that's actually we have to keep in mind. And then this is actually really bad if um, there is uncertainty uh, on um, American foreign policy. So um, they take time. They have to take time to decide the strategy. And then also, they have to take time to change the strategy. So uh, if like, uh, Trump administration changes the stance and strategy for uh, China frequently, then um, Chinese, uh, China may not respond um, quickly enough and uh, uh, not uh, flexibly enough. Um, that's actually the one thing that uh, I would like to uh, mention. The second thing is uh, there is a, so Trump administration is administration. It's a, so it's actually the set of the people. So uh, it's a multiple people. So, and then correct, and somehow corrective decision making. So it's not just Mr. Trump. Uh, but also, uh, there are like uh, several um, members of the cabinet and uh, uh, advisors who have a strong interest in the China policy. And then one of them is uh, uh, Peter Navarro, uh, the um, the chair uh, of the uh, National Trade Council, which is the new council that was established along with the Trump administration. 
he's an economist, but at the same time, he basically ignores all the almost everything that is written in uh, economics textbook <laughs> and uh, yeah. talks about um, protectionism and then also he uh, is a strong advocate of the possibility of war with uh, China and then he calls US kind of like a strategy as a kind of trade war so um, he is a very um, hawkish against China and also he is the uh, advocate of uh, protectionist policy um, not just toward China, but also, uh, but actually, but mostly um, toward uh, China. Um, it's not a good news for China and also Xi Jinping. Um, and also, um, if you look at uh, other members, um, Mattis and Tillerson, who are, um, I would say, who are doing like, much more sensible things uh, about for, for foreign policy, but uh, overall, um, China evaluate uh, Mr. Mattis and Mr. Tillerson as uh, um, hawkish uh, towards um, China. So that's actually China worries about about them. Um, so they are like hawkish for a different reason. Um, so what I'm worried about is the thinking about considering the inflexibility of the Chinese foreign policy, um, kind of attacking Xi Jinping and then weakening. Um, China's position um, in international relations may lead the Xi Jinping administration to be willing to uh, fight so-called economic war if Trump administration starts uh, economic war. Um, well, to be f fair to the administration, the, they haven't started anything. So, uh, so it's, we have to uh, talk about the possibility of economic war simply based on what President Trump said during the campaign. Uh, but one concern is if United States starts the economic war against China, then China may take it. And then once China take it, problem is it will not, China cannot change it. Um, even if US suddenly changes the course. So that's actually one thing that I, um, I'm uh, worried about. Um, where the kind of conflict may be escalated um, in the um, um, in, in terms of the U.S.-China relationship, there are uh, four kind of troubled spots in East Asia: North Korea, Taiwan, East China Sea, and South China Sea. And uh, North Korea issue is slightly different, so I will not talk about it here. Um, Taiwan and South China Sea is particularly a uh, big issue. Um, East China Sea, uh, US presence so far has been very strong. And then also this time, uh, 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 Mr. Mattis' uh, visit to Japan really affirmed uh, US presence in East China Sea. So uh, I'm, not, I'm less worried about it. But uh, Taiwan and South China Sea is uh, very vulnerable. And in terms of the domestic politics in China, impact on the domestic politics in China, Taiwan issue is very important. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that uh, uh, Trump's uh, phone call with uh, President Tsai Ing-wen um, kind of is talking about kind of suspicion or like a skepticism of uh, one China policy, that really weakened uh, Xi Jinping administration. And then I guess like a recent like a change uh, of the softening position uh, of the Trump administration uh, about Taiwan issue uh, to uh, for um, against China is uh, um, maybe may, it may come from um, um, some advising um, for on this issue. So uh, taking in, taking into consideration um, Chinese domestic politics, uh, talking about Taiwan issue is uh, very uh, it's a very sensitive topic. Um, so again, so talking about or a Taiwan issue or I kind of kind of like pushing. Um, United States for Taiwan, uh, skepticism about of the one China policy will empower the, those like hardliners and conservatives in the Chinese Communist Party. So um, that's actually uh, another uh, concern. Finally, actually, I would like to end uh, my comments with uh, talking about kind of worst case scenario, uh, which I hope not to happen, but uh, there is a possibility which had never been a possibility um, in, during the past administration. That is, if US really takes aggressive stance against China, 
and then China responds aggressively, maybe in South China Sea, maybe in Taiwan, maybe in East China Sea, and then, then Trump says, okay, so get some like a good trade deal, um, like um, um, uh, voluntary restraints of the uh, of the exports from China or something like that. And maybe it's just symbolic, but uh, you know, uh, but, uh, just symbolic, but still symbolic and then meaningful for uh, Mr. Trump. And then, if U.S. backs down after escalating uh, the uh, aggression, then that will really lower the U.S. credibility in the East Asia. So other countries will see, okay, so then like the United States, we cannot trust. So um, if like. Uh, U.S. really takes aggressive stance, and then China responds aggressively, and then U.S. backs down. This would be the kind of worst-case scenario um, in the, um, uh, for um, the security of uh, East Asia. So um, now uh, I'd like to pass uh, to um, um, uh, my colleague, uh, Diana Newton, uh, who was, I think that uh, everybody also I think knows uh, Diana, but uh, she was in um, um, NSC and uh, uh, State Department, um, and uh, especially during the Clinton administration, uh, working with Jim Steinberg, and uh, uh, my great colleague, and distinguished uh, colleague, and my uh, a very good friend of mine. So well, thank Diana. you, Hiroki. Okay. I really appreciate that. And it is uh, my pleasure to be here today. And as uh, Hiroki said, um, we, he and Lai and I were trying to think about um, coordinating our talks, and um, we discussed this idea that the president really seems to have three themes that underpin his worldview and that sort of affect his policies both at home and abroad. Um, the first being um, uncertainty and surprise. Um, this idea that the speed and volume of, of policy decision making is, is paramount. Um, it's almost more important to keep everyone guessing and keep the ball moving and fix the mistakes later as they come up than to sort of slow down and have a, a, a process that's more deliberative. Um, and, and so that was, that was one interesting thing. And the second thing that we realized is he's really anti-institutions. And he talked a lot about that during the campaign. And he really um, hasn't completely changed uh, that, although it's, again, a little hard to know. Um, but that he really prefers bilateral negotiations. He loves the idea of deal-making, negotiating one-on-one -on -one is his, obviously his preferred um, way of interacting as a businessman and now as a, as a president. Um, and then he has a strong business identity. Um, and he likes this idea of an a la carte menu for deals and alliances. It's kind of, I'll take that, but not that. I'm going to choose this, and um, I'm going to rework it. And then lastly, that he's very um, pro-protectionism, pro right? Anti-globalization. Um, he wants to advocate for those who've been hurt by globalization. Uh, he wants to bring jobs and prosperity back to the regions of our country where they feel that they have really lost some of that. And um, and in a way, he campaigned you know, on sort of yes for America and no for anyone else, right? And that could be immigration, it could be trade, it could be other things, but that's sort of his philosophy. Um, and so starting with uncertainty and surprise, um, I just have to say, as I planned and prepared for this talk, it was really, I mean, this is such a different talk than I thought I would be giving when I agreed to give the talk um, maybe last December. Um, and then I frankly have come up with some ideas that are different from when Lai and Hiroki and I had lunch last week. Um, I thought I would be talking about the president's kind of belligerent stance towards Asia, his um, flouting of America's one China policy, his um, asking Japan and China to pay for their security and, and for their basing, um, suggesting that both Japan and North Korea get um, their own nuclear arsenal, South Korea get their own nuclear arsenals. Um, you know, and he, his killing of TPP in a very dramatic um, and public way. Um, and yesterday I was even thinking, oh well, gosh, it's even become more timely thanks to the North Korean launch on Saturday. I mean, you know, what I was going to talk about really, really relevant. I wanted to thank the North Koreans for that. Um, <laughs> the, um, the public uh, kind of um, dramatic death of someone in the North Korean ruling family, probably assassination, um, was also kind of feeding into what I was going to talk about. Um, and then I woke up this morning and I thought, well, there we go. Now we're back to Russia and the National Security <laughs> Council and the news is on to a, a completely different topic. So um, with, with the caveat that everything I say today may be upended tomorrow, um, I, I just thought I would talk a little bit about what I think the Trump administration's 
um, policy actions have been with regard to Japan and South Korea <coughs> and North Korea. Um, and I think what's really interesting is that if we filter out the noise of everything else and the campaign rhetoric and the rocky transition and the protectionist tendencies, but we look at the actual actions of the first month of the Trump administration um, and the actions that Trump has taken and his cabinet have taken towards Japan and South Korea, um, I think there's actually reason for our Asian allies to be slightly optimistic at this point in time. Um, now, a large part of this credit goes to Prime Minister Abe, I think, from Japan. Um, Abe called immediately after the election, um, wanted to have, and there was, um, I'm recalling maybe not completely clearly, but I think Abe had interacted with um, Senator and Secretary Clinton when she was running um, and had a one-on-one -on -one with her at, at, on the side of something else before the election. And he did not want to be seen as being overly pro uh, the Clinton you know, uh, campaign. So he called right away, um, got on the phone with President Trump, um, and or President-elect Trump at the time, congratulated him, um, and was quick to set up a visit um, he actually came to Trump Tower and visited with um, President-elect Trump on November 16th. He was the first world leader to visit with the President-elect on his way to the APEC summit in Peru. Um, and we can presume from President Trump's demeanor that he really liked that expression of immediate support, that show of loyalty, that sort of recognition. Um, and then, I, so I think Abe really began early building this relationship of trust and uh, personal accountability and friendship. Um, so the bilateral visit just concluded. Um, more dramatically than I think it would have uh, if North Korea hadn't launched a missile in the middle of dinner. Um, but uh, it went very well. I mean, I think that the bilateral relationship um, is off to a good start. I think that the two men seem to have some kind of rapport and friendship. Um, I think the fact that the missile launch by North Korea happened while Abe and Trump were in the middle of dinner was actually quite fortuitous for us. Um, because I think Pres Prime Minister Abe may have had an impact on how President Trump responded. Um, the response was uncharacteristically reserved. Um, it reiterated yeah. in like six <laughs> words that um, he, the United States stands 100% by our ally Japan. He didn't tweet about it. Um, he later added in a statement that we support Japan and our allies in Northeast Asia. I think South Korea was sort of desperate for a shout out yes. at that moment. But, um, and he called on North Korea to abide by the UN rules and regulations. So back to our sort of theme that he's anti-institution, he is, but he also said to North Korea, you know, you, you guys are out of line. You're, you're not following the rules. So that was sort of interesting. Um, one step removed from the White House, the Secretary of Defense, Mattis, went to Northeast Asia. That, his first trip was, his first country was Japan. He also went on to South Korea. Um, the purpose of the trip was to reiterate support for the Allies, almost in a way to undo, I think, some of the things that um, President Trump, the candidate, was saying on the stump. Um, he really stressed freedom of navigation um, operations and that that was, you know, America's primary consideration in the region w with regard to the South China Sea and China's belligerence wasn't so much that we needed to fight China, but more that we needed to keep the commons, the global commons open for everyone. Again, sort of world order, you know, institutions 101. Um, so that's sort of interesting. Um, Secretary of State Tillerson um, caused quite a bit of controversy in his initial uh, confirmation hearing statements when he said that China should uh, we should, the U.S. should block China's access to the disputed islands in the South China Sea. Um, this policy option has completely fallen by the wayside. He responded in longer written questions differently. Um, he hasn't mentioned it since. Um, and he has really talked more, um, less about blocking China to, again, freedom of navigation operations being the United States policy objective. Um, he had a phone call with for Japan's Foreign Minister Kishida before the summit with Abe. Um, confirming that the U.S. will defend the Senkakus if necessary and calling into the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance, Article 5, that yes, that does mean that if the Senkakus are somehow taken over by China, the U.S. is obligated to defend. Um, and then he followed that phone call up with a pull aside with the foreign minister um, on the sidelines of the Trump-Abe summit. So um, I think for Japan, the key issue for Abe has been, and he has thus far, I would say, succeeded, um, to create a good relationship with President Trump. I think ideologically they're actually a little bit more in line. I mean, Abe is right, right wing uh, in Japan. Um, and Abe and Obama didn't always see eye to eye, didn't have a great relationship, weren't very friendly. Um, and so I think Abe feels a little bit more friendship and kinship with um, President Trump. And I think that's 
been good for him, and I think it's been good for us. Um, and with the North um, Korea missile launch happening with them together, I mean, I think he was able to make all the points he could ever have wanted to make about how important it is that this alliance remains strong, that the U.S. troops that are in Japan and in South Korea are essential. Um, and he can also take that opportunity to remind President Trump how much Japan pays for the privilege of having our troops there um, and that really they don't owe more. Um, the only negative for Japan has really been the cancellation of the TPP, right? That evisceration of that trade deal was a huge blow for Abe, both personally and professionally. Um, but I think being in person um, with Trump, being the person who was with Trump during the North Korean launch was a huge triumph for Abe. Um, thanks to the fact that it occurred in a public dining room and thanks to Facebook and people posting their photos. We can all see, I and mean, the world can see them working together, acting like leaders. Um, I think it's a PR coup for Abe that allows him to save some face in the wake of losing the TPP. Um, he's, he's sort of the new president's BFF, right? And I think that, that's good. It's good for Japan. It's good for us um, as well. So um, moving on to the Koreas, um, South Korea obviously right now is in political turmoil, right? They're waiting a vote on impeachment. The President Park has um, had to, I mean, many cabinet members have resigned. She's had to sack a few, and she is really in limbo. Um, and so they've had absolutely no time to focus on the Trump administration or interact with the Trump administration or set up a visit or anything. So I think for the maybe first and last time in South Korean history, they're actually happy to be riding the coattails of Prime Minister Abe. <laughs> um, and they are um, allowing him to do the, you know, carry the water for that part of the world. Um, as a personal aside, I sort of secretly hope that somehow the fact that um, Japan and South Korea need to work together in this moment would help hopefully bring them together in a way that they haven't been able to get over since World War II, but um, my colleagues last week when I mentioned that to them said I was being overly idealistic. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I do think um, neither South Korea nor Japan wants to get their own nuclear arsenals, and you know, Abe made that point. Um, South Korea pays a lot for the bases and want to, wants to keep American troops on the DMZ line the 38th parallel, so I think Abe was able to make that point as well for them. Um, I think it's obvious from the missile launch that, you know, if, if Trump weren't focused on it before, the U.S. needs a strong presence in the area. And I think South Korea is obviously even happier than they were before last week to get the THAAD, the um, Terminal High Altitude Area Defense Missile Defense System, um, which oh, the Obama administration had been talking about putting into South Korea. Um, China, of course, objects to it. I think now, after this missile launch, it's a foregone conclusion. And so I think, in a way, that will proceed despite China's opposition. Um, with regard to North Korea, I mean, they've been trying to make headlines um, desperately, and they've succeeded. Um, they don't want to be on the back burner, I guess, while Japan and the United States were having their initial summit. I don't think it was any accident that the missile was launched during the summit. Um, it was a f supposed to have been the first land-based test of an intermediate-range missile. Um, it was a soccer, solid rocket fuel launch, which means that the rocket has to sit on the la launch pad for less time, which makes it harder to detect in terms of surveillance videos and things like that. Um, so it's considered a real technological advance for North Korea. Um, the question that's still completely up in the air is um, whether or not um, there's any, you know, if they're any closer to putting a nuclear warhead on that missile, and I think that's really still up in the air. Um, but, but as a result of the launch, um, a new diplomatic option is on the table for the first time in years, which is more diplomatic talks, reopening talks with North Korea, the six-party talks, which also included Russia in addition to China, Japan, and South Korea, and North Korea, and the United States, um, you know, I think is, is back in the limelight. It was sort of off the table during the Obama administration, but um, everyone feels that the sanctions have not been working, um, that you know, obviously North Korea has continued to go ahead with its nuclear program, with its uh, aggressive missile, intercontinental ballistic missile program. And so in an effort to make that, s break that stalemate, there's some push that, um, that you know, Trump should, should initiate talks. Um, the one controversial point is that on the campaign trail, um, the candidate Trump suggested that he would just pick up the phone and call um, Kim Jong-un. That has typically not been a policy position of the United States. Um, hard to say whether or not he still feels that way. I mean, again, his response on, on Saturday night was quite reserved and seems very much in keeping with figuring out how to work with allies and with the, you know, our foreign policy establishment in the United States. Unclear how that's going to go forward. Um, the assassination of Kim Jong-nam in the Malaysian airport just 
strange. Um, you know, I think maybe once Kim, if if it was done intentionally and very publicly, wants to show that he's really in charge and he's got complete control of North Korea, and they should not think that there are reformers to be worked with. And and despite high level defections which have occurred recently, that you know, no, it's really going to be this regime, and this is the way it, you know it's going to be. Um, so really hard to know exactly what's going on. Um, so. Just to wrap up, I guess wh while I'm surprised myself that I am mildly optimistic on what the Trump administration has actually done in Northeast Asia since the inauguration, um, I just don't know that we can rely on any of these actions as a straight line trajectory for what's going to come next. Um, anything can happen. This is a president who feels far more comfortable with economic statecraft tools than he does with national security statecraft tools. So, you know, his idea of using tariffs and sanctions and other things. You know, who knows where he'll go with that and what the implications will be. Um, I also feel that he's he's suffering badly right now from a lack, lack of expertise and, frankly, just bodies, right, in the national security apparatus of his administration. Um, he desperately, desperately needs a better process in all aspects um, of his White House. Um, I think it was Donald Rumsfeld who said, with a great process, you cannot always have a perfect outcome, but with a messy process, you will most certainly have difficulties in your outcome, and I think we've certainly seen that. Um, and I think he, I do think that the president can get a lot of this under control by choosing a good, experienced, trusted national security advisor. The job is now open again, so um, I think if he, if he can choose someone who is experienced and also someone whom he trusts and who has direct access to the president and shouldn't have to go through necessarily, have to go through political advisors, um, he can calm down a, a lot of this, I think, um, or a lot of the uncertainty at least. So, um, you know, I, I think that if he can settle down some of the uncertainty and bring back U.S. reliability, this idea that we are there for our allies when they need us, um, then I think our Asian allies will feel better than they did during the Obama administration, frankly. Um, I think, you know, Obama had this um, uh, strategic patience that he wanted to kind of use in the region, which I think a lot of our allies felt like, well, what does that mean? When the Chinese show up, are, are you going to be there or not? Um, I think Trump has, you know, has the opportunity to be more um, present and more reliable, um, but we'll have to see. And I think, you know, it might keep, I mean, if he is more engaged in the region, it will keep China, North Korea, and Russia on their toes. So, we'll see. Um, and then, um, Dr. Lai Leong, my <laughs> colleague and my friend. Um, <laughs> she and got a good friend, I only got friend. Uh, <laughs> 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 We're paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> Here is the meeting. <laughs> well, our um, South China specialist and uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, South uh, East Asia specialist, um, and uh, she's going to talk about um, U.S. Southeast Asia relationship. I'm sorry about that teasing. We, we are good friends, and so I think you wrote me into a little bit of teasing. He did turn red. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to talk about Southeast Asia. I've, I've sort of given myself the impossible task of talking about 10 different countries, as you guys know, in Southeast Asia. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to be talking about all of them. It's impossible uh, in the time that uh, we have. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Southeast Asia as a whole. Uh, and then in the Q&A, if there's interest, uh, you know, we can talk about specific countries. And obviously there's divergence among the different countries. Uh, but I think there, it's also worth talking about Southeast Asia as a whole uh, because they do share some common, important commonalities. Um, so there's a saying, it's an African saying, that when <laughs> elephants fight, the grass gets trampled. Uh, and uh, you, you could very well uh, see how in, the, you know, in this analogy uh, applied to Southeast Asia, you know, Japan, Korea, China, the U.S. would be the elephants, and that leaves Southeast Asia as the grass. Um, so when there is uncertainty, the variables uh, for possible outcomes just sort of multiply. Uh, for Southeast Asia, uh, you know, smaller countries, they just don't have the, the heft, the strategic heft. Uh, and so in, in some ways, they have to be more reactive. Uh, they have a lot less uh, leverage. And so for smaller countries like Southeast Asia, uh, s stability and predictability are even more important. And that level of trust is even more important uh, that Diana and Hiroki uh, have been talking about. Uh, so the question for a lot of Southeast Asian countries at this point is, how engaged 
and, and in what way will the U.S. be? So we're talking not only about the level of engagement, but also how, uh, you know, the, the, the militarily, economically, uh, and, and so on. Uh, now for Asia, for Southeast Asia, I think they've had a pretty good ride uh, in the last two administrations. Uh, George W. Bush and uh, Barack Obama uh, really, you know, gave a lot of uh, attention to, to Asia, uh, to Southeast Asia. Uh, so it, in the case of Obama, of course, we've got that famous pivot, which, by the way, a lot of Southeast Asians see really not merely as a pivot, pivot to Asia, but a pivot to Southeast Asia. Uh, that is really bringing a, a lot of resources to Southeast Asia, turning to, to, to Southeast Asia uh, in terms of um, soft power as much as, as military power. Uh, and then, of course, under Bush, uh, prior to Obama, uh, a lot of uh, old Asia hands were seen to be at the helm of Bush's uh, foreign policy, so people like Powell to some extent, and Armitage for sure, uh, and, and th th these, those people were reassuring. And then you might recall that actually in Bush's uh, first year in office, he had a slew of Southeast Asian leaders come through uh, Washington, D.C., uh, and that Obama uh, is uh, the most, uh, has made more trips to Asia uh, than to, uh, and, and, and his first trip uh, internationally was to Asia, um, but he has made more trips to Southeast Asia than any uh, president uh, before him. So, so Saudi Arabia has had a good ride. Uh, so, you know, coming on to Trump then, um, there is a lot of um, apprehension. Uh, for the time being, unlike the case of China or Japan, uh, not a lot has been said, if nothing, to my knowledge, has been said publicly <laughs> about Saudi Asia. Uh, which might not be a bad thing. Uh, you know, Barry might know this expression, having spent time in Singapore, you know, it, uh, there's a Hokkien expression about, you know, that you siam things, right? Siam is to, to avoid. You try to avoid, you know, what will be coming at you. And so far, Southeast Asia has managed to siam, right? All, all these things have been coming out uh, of Washington, D.C., and it is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, but having said that, uh, there is, uh, as, as always, a need for clarity, uh, just because the United States, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, in many ways, needs the United States. Uh, uh, and needs, it needs the United States to be there, to be engaged. Uh, and to really know where the Southeast Asians are coming from strategically as well. And there's a certain amount of nuance there that I think, and I think there's some fear among Southeast Asian leaders and governments that perhaps Trump uh, and his lack of knowledge about Asia, and, and notice how, I, I mean, you know, even though Tillerson has, has had global operations as, as um, ExxonMobil CEO, um, there hasn't really been a lot of strong Asia presence, uh, apart from China. Uh, and even so, those tend to be more hardliners. Uh, so, so there's a concern about knowledge about Southeast Asia and uh, uh, understanding the nuances of uh, what the Southeast Asians need to do strategically. So for Southeast Asia, the buzzwords are economics and security, and the two are very closely intertwined. So economic integration, regionally, globally, supports security. And security, made possible by strategic relationships, provides the stability for economic growth and development. Uh, and, and also for political stability, for regime uh, stability. So ASEAN has made the multilateral approach, right, this focus on institutions, uh, the hallmark uh, of its foreign policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis larger powers. And, th and this is especially the case with security. Uh, what this means is that uh, ASEAN is committed to a rule-based, uh, a rules-based regional and global order. Uh, and, and that type of approach has thrived, obviously, under Bush and Obama, who have supported uh, the, the, the development of a very liberal global order. Uh, and also, uh, the multilateral approach also uh, has made hedging between China and the U.S. Uh, a necessity uh, in the case of Southeast Asia. <coughs> So given the structural constraints as, as smaller countries uh, in this sort of larger regional uh, order, ASEAN has actually been remarkably successful in terms of being able to maximize its strategic uh, flexibility. It has maintained regional peace, which is not to be taken for granted, uh, and it has exceeded expectations economically. Right? So uh, the world's largest economies, US, China, Japan, uh, have invested uh, a lot in, uh, in Southeast Asia. And, and, that's, and if you think about other parts of the world, other regions of the world, the Middle East, Africa, Central Asia, uh, even Latin America perhaps, Southeast Asia really has been a, a, a success, uh, a winner, exactly. So, but ASEAN's achievements have required this delicate balancing, the balancing act. Uh, developing close ties with the US on the one hand, and with China too, but also falling, but, but also avoiding falling 
into either exclusive sphere of influence. So that delicate balance, uh, very important. The U.S. is seen as a benign hegemon, but fortunately it's very far away, right? So that, that's good. Um, uh, whereas China is much closer and therefore is seen to be more threatening. Okay, so running through the, uh, the structure that Hiroki has set out um, at the beginning. So one, the failure of the uh, Trump administration to clearly communicate its intentions uh, is of particular concern to Southeast Asia uh, because uh, Southeast Asians want to know, will the U.S. work with existing regional institutions uh, into which they have invested a great deal? Uh, Asia or ASEAN has relied on quiet and very gradual uh, rulemaking, right? They, they really move slowly. So in the context of what Diana was describing just a few minutes ago in terms of this sort of willingness to turn and swerve uh, that, that uh, the Trump administration might engage in, not so good. Uh, you know, ASEAN, ASEAN doesn't work that way. Uh, and, uh, and it's going to put ASEAN uh, very much on the defensive. And they're really going to worry uh, because they have used these uh, regional institutions to really draw both the U.S. and China in particular into a set of norms uh, that, that benefit Southeast Asia, uh, that, uh, that, that make things predictable, that make things accountable. Uh, and if that's all being thrown to the wind, well, you know, what, what is ASEAN going to do next? It, it, it really sort of opens up a can of worms. Um, and then, of course, in terms of the South China Sea that uh, Hiroki already alluded to, uh, it has been in ASEAN's interest to assert the primacy of international law. Uh, and if, uh, and, and Trump's sort of cavalier and unreliable talk uh, about treaties, about international institutions, that undercuts uh, ASEAN's ability to kind of stand up to China in terms of saying, look, you know, this is what international bodies have to say about the South China Sea. Uh, and you need, you need uh, the U.S. to be able to back that up. Uh, now, on the one hand, uh, you know, Trump seemed to have made some reference to international law in regards to North Korea, but who knows if that's just you know expedient. You know, at that time, uh, the the actual uh, the, the the level of support, the the depth of support that the Trump administration might, might have for international law is just um, open to question at the moment. Okay, in terms of the protectionist rhetoric, obviously the TPP, the killing of the PPP, a big, big deal, much, much more so um, than it would have been the case. You know, in Japan, you, you seem to suggest that maybe now with you know uh, Abe and Trump getting on so famously that, uh, that that might be mitigated. Not so in Southeast Asia. In Southeast Asia, that was a big letdown. Uh, Singapore had invested a great deal in it, and in fact, the Singapore's FTA with uh, the U.S. was sort of part of the. Um, uh, um, founding structure that the TPP built on, uh, and, and Singapore really come out of its way to, to, to promote it, to support it. Uh, Brunei, Malaysia, and Vietnam are the other countries in Southeast Asia that had uh, signed on to it already or committed to it. Uh, and in the case of Malaysia and Vietnam in particular, uh, had really uh, done so also at, at some domestic cost, you know, kind of like Abe. Uh, and, and they have not seen any returns on that. And, and Vietnam, uh, be, with given its proximity, and I can talk about that later in Q and A. There's interest. Uh, given its proximity to China and a, sort of a different relationship to China than perhaps the rest of Southeast Asia, you know, really that's quite uh, that, that's quite painful for them. Um, so, so quite frankly, the rejection of the TPP was unthinkable. I mean, and, the, and from South, from the East South Asian point of view, it was seen as sort of irrational. Why, why, would, why would the U.S. do this? It just doesn't make sense uh, you know, in terms of, of the calculations of Southeast Asian governments. And it sends the signal, unfortunately, that U.S. engagement in the region is narrow uh, and cannot be counted upon. Uh, in fact, the Singapore Prime Minister uh, called the TPP a litmus test uh, for U.S. commitment uh, for its strong signal uh, of its pivot to Asia. So withdrawing from the TPP suggests perhaps that the pivot is not going to help. Um, happen anymore. As I said at the beginning, if the pivot for a to Asia is seen by Southeast Asians as a pivot to Southeast Asia, this obviously is a, a major uh, change. So ASEAN is now likely to turn more to RCEP, Regional Cooperation Economic Partnership, which is of course led by China. Uh, and this is more, and then China of course has other projects in Asia, as you're aware. You've got the Maritime Silk Road, which is part of the uh, One Belt, One Road uh, proposal scheme that uh, China has put forward. And then, of course, there's the uh, AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. So all of this is likely to pull Southeast Asia uh, much more so into China's gravitational force. Um, and that is, and, and of course, China and ASEAN, by the way, already have the largest free trade area in the world. 
Uh, so, so you know, it, I don't want to overstate it, but it does almost look like you know I, I was on Facebook uh, the night of Trump's uh, election, uh, and um, my friends uh, in Southeast Asia were essentially saying, "All right, all of us, we better start brushing up on our Chinese. This is you know this is the future." Um, <laughs> Okay, so uh, third point, regional security. Um, I think I've already touched upon some of that. Uh, another quote from the Singapore Prime Minister, Lee Sen Lo, he says, if you, he said to Americans, if you are, not, to an American journalist, if you're not prepared to deal when it comes to cars and services and agriculture, can we depend on you when it comes to security and military arrangements? Uh, so, you know, Southeast Asians kind of really see economics and, and security as, as tightly bound together. And, you know, what Diana said earlier about how Trump seems to favor the sort of economic statecraft over national security statecraft, it, it doesn't work so well in the Southeast um, Asia uh, scenario. Um, so, okay, I, th I think I've spoken enough about regional security. You can talk a little bit more uh, later if you want. And then just two more points that apply much more to Southeast Asia than to the China uh, or to, to East Asia in general. Uh, one is Islam and terrorism, and two, human rights and governance issues. Mm -hmm. So in the case of Southeast Asia, we've got uh, um, big Muslim countries. Indonesia, of course, the largest Muslim country in the world. And then you've got Malaysia as well. Uh, so uh, Trump's immigration order has done a, a bit of damage there. Uh, how will that pan out in terms of his uh, desire to fight terrorism, uh, what he calls radical Islamic terrorism? Uh, also in the face of, by the way, some resurgence of uh, terrorist activities by uh, extremist Muslims in that part of the world. Um, you know, hard, hard to say, uh, given this sort of um, uh, uh, Saudi Asians, Indonesians and Malaysians in particular have not responded well, as you can imagine, not re uh, reacted well, as you can imagine, to the immigration uh, order uh, and, and see it really as an attack on Islam. Uh, and uh, today, of course, uh, Trump is meeting uh, Netanyahu from Israel. And uh, the, the, what I saw in the New York Times is that he is essentially saying that the two-state solution is actually, uh, the U.S. might not adhere to that after all. Uh, 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 that ups, that's up for grabs. Uh, and uh, Indonesians and Malaysians are watching that. Uh, they do feel very strongly about the Palestinian uh, issue, uh, and that will further complicate uh, relations. And not only will it further complicate relations between the U.S. and these countries, but it will also limit options to some degree for those governments themselves, right? So if, if they've got popular uh, anti-U.S. sentiments uh, uh, on the ground, then it's much harder for them to also pursue strategic uh, their strategic goals. It, it, it limits their flexibility. And then finally, on human rights and governance issues. So South Asia actually has done very well, I think, on the whole, uh, in terms of movement towards democracy in the last 10, 20 years. Uh, it might very well be the case that uh, U.S. attention to issues of human rights and governance will fall off under the Trump administration. He's, after all, under attack himself for authoritarian tendencies. Uh, and, and this is, uh, would be unfortunate. Uh, in, in Thailand, of course, we have a military government uh, that may or may not uh, uh, allow for the return of elections. Uh, Burma, of course, is undergoing an important transition to democracy. Uh, was very close to, to Hillary Clinton. We'll see what happens with that. Uh, and then up with those Philippines, uh, very interesting, of course, we've got uh, Duterte, President Duterte, who's very much a Trump-like figure. Uh, and uh, you know, what, what he'll do, uh, uh, he's already come under a lot of criticism, international criticism for his war against uh, drugs. Uh, so so you know, how, what, what sort of leverage will the U.S. have in terms of managing that? Uh, again, uh, uh, open to a question. Uh, so, uh, so I think I'll, I'll end there to leave lots of uh, time for uh, question and answer. Okay. Um, actually, I'd like to uh, open uh, to the... Uh, discussion to, uh, with the floor, and uh, so, uh, Barry. I have one underlying sort of issue that goes beyond what we're talking about today, and that is the whole movement in the U.S. for the separation of powers between the different branches of government. And I think this could come to a bigger head uh, under Trump who seems to think the presidency is the sole runner of the U.S. government and Congress and the courts don't matter. And I think that we'll see as we move into, uh, especially if we end up with worldwide recession as regard of you know, anti-trade and uh, economic growth policies of Trump's uh, administration, 
I think we could see this coming to a head, and I think this would have a tremendous effect on how the U.S. conducts foreign policy. Anyway, what do you think? Do you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> Diana would, would be the, 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 the best person. Um, you know, uh, so absolutely. I mean, I worry more about the economic um, results of the Trump economic policies. I mean, truly, if enacted, I mean, here in Texas, our economy would die. Um, I think that would create a worldwide recession. So yes, all of that concerns me. I, I think that's more likely than that Congress will roll over or that even the courts will roll over in the face of a Trump try, you know, attempt to take over. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I think that the Republicans on the Hill are trying so hard to say, let them have a chance, let's see where this is going. I mean, someone just today, I, I think it was Rand Paul, said, um, you know, we're spending so much time on what's going on here, we can't get any policy, you know, we can't get on with the repeal of Obamacare or whatever their policy objectives are. Um, you know, I, I th have to think that at some point, if this doesn't settle down and start, you know, the, the, there will have to be more investigations and more upheaval. And so I, I don't um, worry as much about, I mean, I do think that the president is unaccustomed to being in a situation where he doesn't get to call all of the shots all of the time. That's my word. Right. Yeah. And, but I do think that the system that he's entered into is still bigger <coughs> than he is. And there are more people acting. And um, I think as we saw with the executive order, judges were very quick to read the law and interpret it as they saw correctly, which happened to not be in keeping with his reading of the law. You know, where that's going to go, I don't know. I think the same with the Hill. I, I, I think that, you know, and typically, you know, the Republicans feel like they have had a Democrat in the White House for eight years. It's time to work with a Republican in the White House. They're trying to be optimistic about that. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure how far that's going to get them if, or how far they can go with that, how far they can run with that if they've got a president who's constantly got um, ethical and, and other problems going on. But. So, um, I'm going to pose this to all three of you. So, I'm not sure how he pronounces his name. Uh, you know, Xi Jinping. Xi. Yeah. Xi yeah. shows up at Davos. He's the new Davos man. <laughs> He's the voice of reason. He's trying to project an image of rationality and being very much in favor of open markets and trade. Now, is he playing to the home crowd to global audience. I mean, how do you interpret that? Which I, I thought was very interesting. Sadly. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, I think there are two things. One is, uh, um, overall, I think what I, Xi Jinping said, I, um, I think he said a uh, uh, good thing. And, um, um, and also, I'm glad that she, she talked about um, for, uh, with uh, um, globalized uh, or pro-global tone, right? right. Um, so I think it's a good thing, uh, but at the same time, one thing is, you know, what he did was a so-called cheap talk, right? Mm -hmm. He doesn't <laughs> promise anything, right? <laughs> and then also he doesn't promise anything to the world either in the sense of he will do some, like, uh, in take initiative of rulemaking of uh, trade or something else. Right, so in that sense, so that's actually, so I think that he kind of found that uh, he found the current um, situation to be a very good opportunity uh, to play uh, the role of good guy uh, mm -hmm. in the world. Uh, and then that itself is, I think, a good thing. But at the same time, if like uh, Xi Jinping wants to implement something that follows what he said in Davos, that would be very, um, uh, very uh, difficult. And then, oh, I'm not saying it's not impossible. I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying it's impossible, but um, uh, it is uh, uh, very difficult because, you know, it, it comes with, uh, uh, it comes with uh, uh, domestic economic reform, which has a lot of resistance uh, in the domestic politics. Uh, do, uh, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, well, I just want to say that um, I, think, I think the optics were great. Uh, certainly, you know, the Southeast Asians probably enjoyed hearing that, you know, nice counterpoint to <laughs> To Trump, uh, but uh, yeah, you know, but but Chinese, uh, you know, even with the free trade area and all of that, Chinese um, uh, engagement with Southeast Asia is not what the 
American engagement in South Asia is like. It's not as deep, it's much more superficial. Uh, and I think South Asians are very pragmatic. You know, they show me where the money is. Um, and uh, they're, gonna, they're, gonna, they're gonna wait and see. Uh, but yeah, you're right, I mean, it was richly ironic. Yeah. Well, and then I would just say to follow up on that, um, in re response to the North Korean missile launch on Saturday night, the Chinese stayed very quiet for a long time and waited to see what the Japanese and the Americans were gonna say. Um, and then later sort of chimed in and said, this is your problem, I hope you'll fix it. Um, <laughs> was, um, that was beautiful. Really so, you know, what we do see, at the very least, is a very savvy leader who is trying very hard um, probably not to get into a Twitter battle with President Trump and to be able to take the, the high road to the extent it benefits China. Does, does, does he tweet? She? I don't know. <laughs> she tweet? <laughs> actually, actually, I don't know. Yeah, I, uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Well, but you know, officially the Twitter is... Yeah, tw Twitter is prohibited in China, so... Uh, yeah. <laughs> something, uh, something, yeah, yeah the equivalent to uh, Twitter, but, um, yeah, Jim. Uh, actually I actually have a question for Hiroki, which spills over into the two other regions, and it's uh, a little bit related to Barry's point. Um, th there, there are not 25 different ways to organize the world for world politics. I mean, you, if we do pull back from this rules-based system, what next? And it seems to me that Trump seems determined to lead us down a nationalist path. And, you know, we, we've, we've seen that before in world history and world politics. And it often provokes nationalist responses in other countries. And, um, uh, and then we go back to a balance of power logic of some sort. So, and it always struck me that Asia, especially East Asia, Southeast Asia. And you know, this contradicts a little bit what you were saying. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. You know, that it, 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 there, there has been much more of a balance of power logic in the politics of this region than almost any other part of the globe. So it seems to me that Trump could really push us in that direction. But my question is specifically for you, because you're an expert on Chinese politics. And you did not mention the PLA. Mm -hmm. You didn't talk about a, a, a possible really ferocious Chinese nationalist reaction. Uh, so far, the Chinese have been restrained, and you know. And I, I, I thought Diana was a little wildly optimistic in her reading of this, but we. No, I, well, <laughs> I'm not optimistic at all. But I had to say, when I looked at what's been said in the last week, it was straight-up U.S.-Asia policy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, um, well, <coughs> nationalism is something that uh, you should worry about um, when you look at the interaction between Chinese domestic politics and uh, international politics. Um, at the same time, also, nationalism comes together with um, vested interests um, in the Chinese um, state capitalist system. So um, very often, like, those state capitalists or those who, who have vested interest in the um, state-owned enterprise system uh, in China, when they oppose anything, uh, that may undermine their, um, their, um, um, their vested interests, they use nationalism. So um, nationalism could be like, a primary source, but you know, it could be secondary source, uh, contingent to uh, 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 vested interests. Um, PLA is also uh, interesting, and then also PLA is usually uh, raised as an important actor when you talk about Chinese decision making as a plural collective decision making. Um, but at the same time, we should not um, uh, forget that uh, actually PLA itself is also a plural actor. And uh, so the different uh, preferences, uh, even within the PLA, so, um, so those, um, so some of the, P so at least, uh, it's true that you know some part of the PLA really like are more hawkish, um, and uh, when they become hawkish, they um, 
use the so uh, they use the um, nationalist factor. But at the same time, those people actually also uh, make a coalition with uh, those who have vested interests. Mm -hmm. And then one place that we have to worry about is actually South China Sea, because though the, one of the major players who have vested interest in the state-owned enterprise system in China, who are really opposing the state-owned enterprise reform in China, is the petroleum industry. And, uh, and then the South China Sea. What does South China Sea have? Oil. <laughs> and then, you know, that's also a place that the uh, hot issue in the PLA are, have a strong interest. So um, it's kind of a China's uh, coalition within the Chinese domestic <coughs> politics is quite complicated. And the nationalism is one of the factors, but uh, may not be the primary factor. So in that sense, what I really regret is uh, uh, TPP did, uh, uh, is now uh, dying. Um, what I thought, uh, you know, one thing that if I have to pick up one thing that TPPAP would be good and also TPP is unique is it, it includes the requirement of the commitment to state-owned enterprise reform. So I thought when TPP was concluded that would be great. It's, it gives the China kind of pressure that and if you want to be a member, you have to be committed to state-owned enterprise reform, and then that will undermine the conservatives, so called uh, anti-reformists, who oppose the, um, um, who like uh, tries to protect the vested interests based on state-owned enterprise reform, who is make, who has a coalition with the uh, hardliners in foreign policy, and that they will be weakened by facing the TPP. And then that's actually may change the China's behavior more for the toward uh, internationalist and the cooperative behavior.